Good morning. Good morning, Lisa. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today on our weekly call for community solutions hosted by the Forbes funds. We have been hosting these calls since March of 2020, if you can believe it. And initially the calls were a response to COVID effort to bring uh, resources and updates to nonprofit organizations, but also give them a platform to share with each other as we were in the middle of a pandemic. Um, last year, we kind of resurveyed to see if folks were still finding value in these weekly convenings after the number of cases was really decreasing um, significantly. And the resounding answer was yes. So we moved more to a call and response kind of format for this convening um, and bringing in vital voices from throughout the Southwest PA region. So this includes nonprofits, elected officials, um, folks from local chambers of commerce, which, which you will hear from today, um, and everything under the sun, really, um, trying to figure out what makes sense in each case um, in representing and solving issues for the nonprofit community. So since March of 2020, we've had 5,063 calls with or over 43,000 participants, much um, due to the time and attention of individuals like you. So thank you so much for joining us this morning. As a quick agenda for today, and I know that the Mon Metro Chamber of Commerce um, isn't a conventional Chamber of Commerce, which we will get into, but the goal is to really um, explore how community members, nonprofit organizations, and leaders can see chambers of commerce as partners in building and rebuilding communities. So for a quick agenda, Fred Brown will give some opening remarks as soon as I do Lisa's intro for the morning. Lisa Franklin Robinson, our guest of honor, who is the executive director of the Mon Metro Chamber of Commerce, will have a discussion with me about her role um, in that position and all of the other community leadership roles that she plays. And then we'll give some brief policy updates and program updates, um, including upcoming events and opportunities to stay involved with GPNP and the Forbes funds. And Lisa, I know we did kind of a quick um, round robin before the call about the UNSDGs that your organization, uh, MMCC, aligns with. But if you wouldn't mind just running through very quickly um, some of the numbers of the 17 okay. that you align with. So one, no poverty. Um, zero hunger in the sense that we feel if you have no poverty and we work to get that right, folks will eat. Um, good health and well-being, it's so important to be able to sustain your business and to support your region. If you have good health and well-being, we're at, with quality education. We partner with the Woodland Hills School District. Gender equality, clean water and sanitation, absolutely. Affordable and clean energy are working closely. And we'll talk about that with a group that's bringing that to our region. Decent work and economic growth, absolutely. Um, industry information and infrastructure in a certain way, absolutely. Um, if we get some of these things really right, um, we will help to reduce inequalities. So sustainable cities and communities, absolutely. Um, let's see, responsible consumption and production uh, to a point in that we do stand with communities to call certain manufacturers on things. So I would say yes. Climate action, absolutely. We're working on plans with communities right now. Um, life below, below water, not really, but we are conscientious of our rivers. Um, so in some ways, life on land, absolutely. Peace and justice, absolutely. And partnerships for the goal. So I can see where we intersect with all 17 um, and where we concentrate efforts um, are not necessarily in the ones you may obviously think we would. So. I hope that answers your question. Oh yeah, I um, and when you shared that you're a team of one currently, I I think my jaw actually might have hit the floor, um, given all the work that you're doing. But um, in a similar vein with the social determinants of health, um, as you can guess, you know, 17 out of 17 goals, pretty strong alignment. Um, five out of five social determinants of health as well. I'm guessing, but if you want to, you know, call some, some specific ones out, go ahead. No, you're absolutely right. Um. Education is really, really um, important to us and at every level um, for the youth, for the uh, re-entering citizen, for the older folks, um, and for those that, you know, are all the way in between who are, who are running back and forth wondering who they are and what they should be doing. We are addressing those needs. 
healthcare and quality, all of that neighborhood and, and, and built environment, social and community context and economic stability for us, all of those go hand in hand. Um, and we literally work in one way or another with, with, we partner with folks who are doing those things. So, and so that's how, even as a team of one, anything can happen because of our partnerships. You, Lisa, that and um, your extensive experience and resume here, which I'm going to get into very briefly before turning it over, Fred. Um, so Lisa Franklin Robinson is a native of suburban Pittsburgh, living most of her life in North Braddock, Pennsylvania. Lisa has a Bachelor of Science in Human Resources Management from Geneva College and a Master of Divinity with a Certificate of Urban Ministry from PTS, P Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. Lisa continues her studies at the seminary as a Doctor of Ministry candidate in 2017. Lisa concluded her work at Pittsburgh Seminary as a member of the Board of Directors and the Alumni Council, but continues to serve on the Metro Urban Institute Advisory Board. She now serves as a board member of the Community Equity and Diversity Council of the Community College of Allegheny County and Local Government Academy the Main Street Pittsburgh, and the Braddock Battlefield History Center. Lisa was recently appointed as a commissioner for the newly formed Eastern Regional Mon Valley Police Commission. Moving on to the next slide. Lisa is a fourth generation resident of North Braddock, Pennsylvania, where she serves as the president of the Borough Council. She worked with a core team to develop a regional comprehensive plan for Braddock, East, East Pittsburgh, and North Braddock, and is developing ways of executing that plan as the executive director for the Mon Metro Chamber of Commerce. Two thirds through the bio, we got to your title that we'll be covering today <laughs> and the Mon Metro Business Equity Initiative. Through this work, Lisa addresses systemic problems of racism and the inequitable distribution of wealth while improving the economic growth and health of the region. Lisa has been the wife of Lawrence Robertson, Robinson Jr. for 23 years. Her community work for flourishing and freedom began at home with her seven children, five biological and two bonus. Maurice, wife Ebony, Brandon, Abriana, Taylor, Adam, wife Anisha, Dorian, wife Danea, and Lawrence III, as well as her six grandchildren, Brandon Jr., Marley, Michael III, and my screen is blocking the bottom. Hold on a second. That would be Moses, Tristan, and Logan. Thank you, Lisa. So, yep. Those are really important partnerships right there. My most Absolutely. important. Mm -hmm. um, I, I so appreciate that you added those to your bio and that when you were going through the sustainable development goals that for the ones that um, you see as kind of linchpins for others, you were like, well, we're not, we're not hitting this yet, but if we do this, this, and this correctly, we will do it. Um, and so I just appreciate your transparency, your centering of relationships in your work. And I know that we are relatively new acquaintances through the faith-based work, um, but someone who has known you longer, Fred Brown, I'd like to invite him very briefly um, to preface the discussion for this morning and talk about Lisa's work. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be on the call. Um, I'm very excited about sharing Lisa with everyone and the work she's pioneered. Um, as you can hear by her overview, she's a juggernaut. She's a force of nature. Um, I don't consider her a one-person team. I consider her a galvanizing force that is able to bring convening interests to the table and have them act with due diligence to solve social phenomena, and not in a transactional way, but in a transformational way. Her faith drives her work. Her honesty and transparency is unrelenting. Um, she's a voice for the voiceless. Um, she stands in the gap for many people. And so for those of you who do not know her personally, she's a jewel um, to our region. And I'm grateful that I've gotten to know her over the years. Um, she didn't speak at all about the work she's doing in Forest Hills as well um, with EOS, which I think is incredibly important for this call to also link to um, the transformational process that are taking places in small cities and towns and communities in our region that offer a unique way to create a holistic delivery system while opti optimizing our reduction of our carbon footprint. And so Lisa's work is transformational. Um, her presentation today will be enlightening. But moreover, I think Emily's alluded to this earlier, having the personality and capacity to collaborate and scale up or down your opportunities is critical in the 21st century global economy. Those of us who harness that in a meaningful way. And I say meaningful because I think it's important to know there are a lot of people to talk about collaborations. There's a lot of people to write letters of support. There's a lot of people 
who support each other's events. But the real work is beyond the event. The real work is pre-event, post-event. It's the actual activity of holding people accountable for the stuff they've committed to. And Lisa is definitely one of those people who stops the bus, holds people accountable. And I think that's why she's so successful. Um, having a light kindred spirit, I know that it can be difficult. People might find you abrasive. I mean, I find it interesting whenever people of color ask for the truth and hold people accountable, we're considered abrasive. I find it intriguing um, that when somebody raises their hand and say, hey, is, you didn't say you were doing that, you're doing this, how is that aligned with this and how is that serving people? And why are you angry? I'm like, I'm just asking for clarity. And so this notion of being vulnerable and fully present and transparent are terms that we use, but the real application, in my estimation, is not widely um, visible to me. I think people don't like conflict in our region. Um, so we just get along to go along to get along. But when you look at the totality of the resources in our region against the problems, the question one has to ascertain in their own psyche is, what have we fixed or resolved? Right. If 93 to 97% of the nonprofits in our region have budgets under $3 million, how are we building them up to be part of an emerging ecosystem to solve social phenomenon? And do we have the propensity, the desire to work collaboratively to reduce the duplication of effort and increase effectiveness and efficiency? And I think Lisa does that extremely well, which is why I think her resume speaks for itself. And so I'm honored to hear about what Lisa's going to share, but I also wanted to acknowledge that to whom much is given, much is required. And it's very important that we own our process. And we also push back when people consider speaking and asking for the truth as being problematic. It's not fake news. It's, it's clarification. And so I just want to put that out there because I know I grow tired of being called adversarial and, and, and confronting uh, people in a way that they're uncomfortable with. But I'm just saying, well, tell the truth. I don't... If you tell the truth, I don't need to confront you about what you're saying is incorrect, right? Um, if you state something, own, live up to it and own it. And so I love that about Lisa. Uh, I was just with her, I think, last week, two weeks ago. I'm at an event. Last week. Last mm -hmm. week. And um, mm -hmm. she just asked the right kind of questions in those kind of spaces. And I think we don't often honor people that are courageous in those spaces and they need support. And I said that even at the event, that the faith-based community has an obligation to go beyond what happens in the walls of the church or the congregation to also support those heroes and sheroes out in the field who are also fighting for equity, fairness, and inclusion that may not be directly aligned with the church from a philosophical or religious perspective, but from a human-centered design approach, it's incredibly important to marry those things in a way to serve humanity. And so I'm excited to hear what she has to talk about. Thank you, Emily, for giving me a few minutes to share who I think is a great friend and colleague, uh, Lisa. Thank you. Fred, I mean, you threw me off center. <laughs> I, um, I'm so honored to be here. And I, I, the words that you said, I mean, coming off of a few things in the past week, you've really, I mean, I was almost falling here. <laughs> I appreciate you. It, it's very difficult sometimes being that person who understands the desperate nature of the folks that we're dealing with. You know, the people that we are dealing with in our communities who, who are suffering uh, from a lot of inadequacies and knowing that there are, there are remedies. I'm not saying that they're easy, but they're not as difficult as 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 what folks make it and to know that we can bring them relief within a matter of days weeks months and it's just by the fact that somebody is just saying no because i don't like the way you said that to me or no because a dotted an i hasn't been dotted or a t hasn't been uh across it 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 makes it hard for you to be silent and it makes it hard for you not to be very direct and that's often misunderstood for aggression, 
it's often misunderstood for anger, as Fred said. But I'm an advocate. I've been an advocate since I was five years old, um, knocking on doors, asking people to go and vote. So that's in the core of who I am. Um, and in this work has been married to me in a, in a very interesting way. So uh, Mon Metro Chamber really, um, I would say, uh, was born out of uh, a, a sense of advocacy. Uh, Tina Doucet uh, was the uh, past president of Braddock uh, Council and realized that Braddock really had to come back uh, from, we remember what Braddock used to be. Um, the, 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 the Mecca of almost 400 businesses on an avenue and it was flourishing. And, and so there was a way that it needed to come back. And we were, uh, she was very um, thoughtful about the fact that gentrification could come in and, 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 and push people in this area and push out folks that have, have been here and stayed and, and suffered through, uh, you know, the, the loss of, of industry, the, the drug addiction, the, the crime, and, and they could get pushed out and others could come in. So th there were round tables di discussions that happened for about a year that she said, let's, let's do that. I was part of that team. And then out of that came, you know, we really need a chamber. Um, when uh, I was called to be the director of that chamber, I didn't really know what a chamber did. And I, I'll be honest, I have had a business myself. Um, it, it did uh, research. Uh, it was successful for about five years. But kind of understanding um, what a chamber does and the needs that it serves in certain communities um, was very important for me to get that understood, to have, to have that become um, understood by the people in the community. What does a chamber do? And that is a question I'm asked a lot, you know, and so we are defining it for our region. We are a hub. We, we um, pride ourselves in being handholders to the businesses, individuals, economic regions and economic development. We handhold in all of those areas. We carry the voice of those who don't know how to say and when to say it, but they know what they need and they can articulate it, we, tr we translate, and then we help to connect people to people, people to jobs, businesses to people, opportunity, and access is a big word for us. Um, I was, a like I said, a fourth generation resident um, in North Braddock. I was blessed to be, come from people who uh, connected all over the planet, and I was not a child who understood limitations. And I understood and learned the um, importance of having access. And as a graduate of the Ellis School and then going on to college and, and working in the court system for almost 20 years, I saw how um, being denied access it, it, and not knowing who you are and how you can best serve uh, was a was a crusher. So we really pride ourselves in access, uh, gaining access for businesses, gaining access for individuals who want to start businesses, or maybe that's not what they should do, um, gaining access for nonprofits to other nonprofits, and um, for us to be able to establish regional development out of that. So I hope I've said enough to kind of give you a foundation. Fred pretty much yeah, I mean, this side of him saying my blood type is a negative, I mean, he really <laughs> he read my whole, I mean, it was pretty wild. So I just appreciate it. So Emily, you know, let's let's have a conversation. Thank you so much, Lisa. And thank you, Fred, for um, for grounding the discussion. I think um, one of the things that's you know very apparent just in the first part of the call is that um, the Mon Metro Chamber of Commerce is not a typical chamber of commerce. And so from the vision of your predecessor into how you've um, really manifested that in your work, if you could speak a little bit about um, what maybe some of the assumptions or like the known variables for chambers of commerce look like, and then how you've been able to kind of do that differently um, to really center the needs of specific individuals or businesses um, that you've been working with. So the best way I, I like to liken it to a uh, chamber unto a uh, gym membership. So why do what do I mean by that? Some people don't really think you need to belong to a gym. 
some people don't understand that there's more to belonging to a gym than just going in and working out. There's communities that you that you develop. There's actually techniques you learn from other folks. There's different ways of engagement that actually help you in your process. And but if you are challenged economically and you say, I don't have the money for the gym membership, then you can't access everything that that gym stands for. Um, and so maybe that's just not for me. In, in communities of color where, where we um, are located, a lot of folks really don't see the need or necessity of having a chamber. So we had to kind of come to them and say, hey, well, let's address some of your problems. We started engaging and intersecting with the community through pain points. Um, the roundtable discussions were like, hey, come together and let's find out what you need. And then we'll try to get you coaching and free legal help and things like that. We then, um, when, when the chamber was formed in, uh, and became incorporated June of 2021, um, we still started in that vein. We have a segment called Conversations Over Coffee, where we have folks that come in and say, so you want to own a coffee shop? And this person who has done that will come and talk for about 10 minutes and then take Q&A because we're into like, how, what are the steps? And then how do we alleviate obstacles and um, how can we create conversation with you um, to help you to say wh whether this is something you want to develop? Slowly kind of pulling people into what a chamber does in terms of like advocacy, as we talked about it. So a chamber, because we're a C6, we literally can advocate um, on behalf of the community, but we can also uh, support a candidate. We're not, we do not have to be politically neutral. We have not really done that as of yet, because that would really take a great board decision and see how we wanted to roll with that, but they can do it. But there are things in the area, in the neighborhood that we say we need. So for example, um, with the whole uh, piece with EOS Energy Enterprises coming into our region, we know, um, because I, as you heard, I sit as the president of North Braddock Borough Council. So there are several communities, Braddock, Rankin, East Pittsburgh, North Braddock, that have suffered greatly over the past so many years with Westinghouse and US Steel thinning down Westinghouse, leaving, and the economic challenges of the region has been devastating. Our, my community, North Braddock, we have over a thousand black blighted parcels. Um, we went from 16,000 people to a probably around 4,700. Um, we, we had uh, folks who were in positions that really just status quo held. That's the way I call them status quo holders. And so now there's a vision. Um, out, when you're in a situation of desperation like that, two things can happen. You can either just stay there and die, or you can start to become creative. And, and that's what has happened. So EOS was brought to our attention. Tina, actually, because she is the founder of the chamber, uh, connected. We connected with them. And we see them as a game changer on several fronts. One they're going to bring jobs. Now, that was kind of up in the air. So here's the advocacy. Because of the connectivity to the, to the folks who work in the region, who are the leaders in the region, we pulled together a group of leaders from East Pittsburgh, Braddock, uh, Forest Hills, uh, North Braddock, and we were in the room with the Department of Energy and said, look, do whatever you can to keep these people here. We need them, not just because it's kind of groovy. We really need the jobs. And not only that, what comes with the jobs, the other manufacturing companies that could come to support them, the, the housing, the all the development that could come, um, and even the needs of the people that are actually working there to support them with uh, change of life, quality of life, skills and things we really need you to be here. And it was the voice of the community partners that was able to anchor and the Department of Energy said, hey, we love this narrative here. We love what, what's going on. And so now EOS is present. Then um, Main Street and Associates, which is a consulting group, they, just, they 
went around and part of that community, um, part of EOS getting support from the government to remain, they have to craft a community benefits plan. And with that community benefits plan, you need someone to execute it. So um, the team went around, they had listening sessions in six communities. And then the, the four that I mentioned, in addition to Forest Hills, there's also Turtle Creek. Um, so I'm saying there's Turtle Creek, East Pittsburgh, Braddock, Rankin, North Braddock, um, and Forest Hills. And those people showed up and said what they needed. And so now they are crafting the plan and the chamber will be the facilitator of that plan moving forward. How do we address the needs that the people said? And then how do we navigate and build partnerships with folks to bring the things that they said they needed to uh, into reality? So it's working on several levels all at once. Um, and that's why I said, even though it looks like I'm a staff of one, I'm not a staff of one. I'm um, Main Street, Lori Rue and her team has helped to build capacity. Forbes Funds has helped to build capacity. I mean, the truth is told, the chamber came out of Forbes Funds C3 Community Initiative. So that was the womb from which we were born um, and have, have um, helped to sustain. We we um, hit the ground running and started talking to everybody that we knew that said, hey, we have the people, we understand our region, we have the connectivity, we know the needs. We're, see, Mon Valley people are people, they don't trust you very well. You know, they're not easy to trust. They're not quick to trust. But once they trust you, they got you, your word is your bond. And if you mess over them, you might as well just go on away and go stick your head under a rock. But they trust us. And so now we're building off of that. And um, it takes more than a village. It takes an ecosystem. And that's what we're, we're working with. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so that sounds incredible, but I also know that um, you briefly mentioned the Mon Valley Business Equity Initiative. And so taking this um, kind of like new work from EOS and some of the, that initiative, how is that also then kind of um, woven into the business equity initiative that's out of the Mon Metro? So the C, so like I said, Mon Metro Chamber of Commerce is a C6. And there is, there is, well, I would say the support, the funding that you can get, every um, funder will not fund a C6 entity. And so, and also chambers typically don't do programming. We have events, we do, you know, community engagement things, we'll, we'll host uh, networking things and, and we'll bring some education forth to businesses in the region. But in terms of programming, so here we assessed our in our community and said our community real our hand holding has to go beyond just an event we need a whole process put in place to be able to support certain things that we want to see happen for folks so that's where the mon metro business equity initiative that's what it came out of so it's a c3 that supports the actual programming needs that we see coming out of some of the chamber work but also we there are some things that we're establishing through the business equity initiative that the chamber couldn't be could not handle. So, for example, Braddock, um, there's a project. It's called the Braddock Lofts Project. There, it's a renovation of the um, old Braddock Junior High. It will be 60 units in there, affordable, 75 percent affordable. 25% market rate. The chamber will be housed in there, but the Mon Metro Business Equity Initiative will create the supportive services for the residents. So it's it in the um, the Braddock Lofts project is done by Derek Tillman from Bridging the, the Gap, and um, it it was another idea that came out of really this. There, there was a prayer walk that happened, and a young man said he had a need. Uh, if I got away from the folks where I'm, you know, dealing drugs and having issues, maybe I might be able to turn my life around. So I talked to Tina about it and she goes, oh, well, maybe we can make that happen. She contacted Derek and here it comes. Now, the supportive services is a heavy lift. Um, 
So we have engaged with partners to do that lift. Main Street, Mon Valley Initiative. Um, and we're, cre we're developing a whole ecosystem. There is a workforce development piece that's coming to support. We partnered with about five or six other groups to reimagine workforce in the Mon Valley. We actually then put in for a grant, the Recompete grant. We didn't get it, but we were the number one at, for a long time, the number one competitor in the region. But we decided that this workforce ecosystem that we developed was so great that we're going to continue to seek funding for it. And that actually goes across the Mon River. Um, so those programs, um, there's, there's a, there's a, a work connection piece to it. Those programs will be housed and developed and fleshed out through the business equity initiative. And it, so it's as we engage through the chamber um, and we develop program that we see are needed for our members, for our region. Um, like, for example, we talked about clean water in air and in and, and EV. So we have, we'll, the chamber will host events to educate the community about EV, but the business equity initiative will create programming to help those people, like maybe I want to become an EV business. Maybe I want to, to, to be, a, to have a charging station and learn about that. We create the programming around uh, that to support those types of efforts is insanely impressive um just i mean the, the coordination and um just the process to be able to divide activities between like c6 c3 other partnerships takes an immense amount of understanding and trust of partners um mm -hmm. and so when you're talking about building in trust and um, specific, specifically for the Mon Valley folks who said are not, you know, quick to trust folks. Um, how are you, this, this links to PJ's question in the chat, um, how do you verify the efficacy of the community benefits plan of EOS, but also, you know, each of the partnerships that you're aligning throughout this process? Because I think that's one of the most difficult, difficult parts of collective impact is maintaining that trust and also, you know, finding the right fit for the right partner. So, I mean, I'm unashamedly, I will just say right now I'm gatekeeping for the Mon Valley. Our group, we do. Like we absolutely find it necessary and we don't mind saying it. So we have an understanding of the wealth and the resources that already exist in the Valley. So for us, our first go-to in a partner is a Mon Valley partner already. So there are people who already do amazing work that are already in the Mon Valley that we go to first. Um, and then as folks have come in, because there are people that come in from the city that come in that say, you know, we want, we want a seat at the table. And that's not a bad thing. But if we already have somebody doing that work, and we know that they're tried and true and celebrated and effective, but they just really need to lock arms to, to stand, we'll go with them first. So it's, and that's, I, I'm, I mean, maybe that sounds foul, but at right now, I feel like we have to be vigilant in this effort because the Mon Valley is huge. We're the Eastern regional area of the Mon Valley. And we know there's a lot of pain points that the city has, and there's a lot of pain points that Allegheny County is dealing with that we have the answer to. We can solve it. And we want, we've thought through it. We have, we are in, in uh, meetings right now with other organizations building our own ecosystem to solve those things. But the one thing that we don't want, we don't want somebody to come through and to really just you know, take advantage of the folks and the land and the thing and things that we know are, are vital in our area. We do not want to see that happen. So, so, uh, you know, gatekeeping, people tend to look at that as a bad thing, but right now I, I, I don't even care how people see it. It's, it's necessary.
So PJ responded as you were speaking, you have to be a gatekeeper. That's the role of a community stakeholder advocating for resilient communities to slow economic velocity so that it doesn't lose touch with the people on the ground that have yet to adjust to the rapidly changing economic environment. Well said. Business equity Amen. initiative. Product, yeah. Product loss project for supportive services. Workforce development project transforms into workforce system, uh, workforce development ecosystem. PJ, I feel like I should just invite you off of mute real quick if you want right. to um, respond to what some of what Lisa said. No, she was cooking. Everything that you said, Queen, was amazing. And um, the, work, the amount of work that you've been able to get done has been great. And uh, you mentioned the capacity building and how that's worked for you as well. I think even being able to navigate that and to maximize the people that are trying to collaborate with you, like to maximize that value, I think is something you've been able to do successfully. I'm still learning how to do that myself, but I just think that's amazing. And uh, you've got so much work done. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing what you're doing. Well, you know, I can't take credit for myself. There's a There's a partner that has been with us from the door, right? From the beginning, um, Greater Valley Community Services. Um, Jackie Smith is a co-founding member of the chamber. And Jackie has, I mean, when you say, if you could, if you had somebody that's just ride or die, Greater Valley is ride or die for the chamber. Anything we need. Braddock's Battlefield History Center. It's another place. It's a, it is the, you know, the French and Indian War was fought on the land where we where we uh, live and work. And the Braddock's Battlefield History Center houses that history. They know that they have to be more than just a museum there. They let us meet there. They bring our neighborhood children in and do whatever there. And they are our ride or die partner because they understand that right now, the first three to five years, you all know of any business is crucial. Um, and right now, as we're building capacity, as Main Street, uh, Lori Rue and her crew have been ride or die. I mean, they these groups have put out for us in ways that we can't even we can't even afford to give back um, because we just don't have the capacity. So we there's no one that you know we don't do this by ourselves. Um, there are folks that are we're constantly. Uh, working, thinking, people letting us at the table, and then as a as a as an elected official, as a leader who who is saying, "Look, we can't do this by ourselves." That's the that was the logic behind the Ben uh, comp plan. Behind uh, um, now we're doing North Braddock is doing supportive services for the other communities that is coming out of our regional policing effort. So in those things, like I said, even though I have to be clear when I'm sitting in one place or another, just to be able to say, okay, I know of a, a nonprofit or an organization that might be able to support this work. And we just call and pull them in. And then it doesn't hurt that the new county executive has, has came to our neighborhood when she was just Sarah. You know what I mean? Um, Summer Lee, when she, you know, she's from my neighborhood. She, these people come and they kind of hang out with us, not in any real way, except to build relationships. And I just think that's the key to, to not really, you know, you go everywhere because no matter where you go, there may be someone there that may just be able to give you what you need uh, to move you just a little bit forward or to connect you to someone that does uh, know you. And and it's it's amazing how um, that works. So it's just really worked for us really well. Yeah. The last thing I'll say is, I, and again, uh, your flowers are definitely well-deserved for sure. And the last thing I would say is, as you look to engage the community more, especially during this time of digital transformation and stuff, uh, we're uh, UMI doing some co-creation work in the space of data sovereignty with the Forbes funds. And I think that you've done the right thing in terms of gatekeeping the assets that you know that are on the table that need to be safeguarded for the community. But there needs to be a process put into place that allows for you to include the community in that process in a way that it can be measured and that it's manageable. And I think that um, when we do this cohort over the next uh, few months here, I think it would be great if you were in attendance because it would give you the 
additional collaborative tentacles that you need to be able to do what you want to do with the community, I think. So I just wanted to well, share that. And I love this presentation. I think you did a great job. Oh, thank you. And um, absolutely. I would love to be in touch with you and, you know, anything um, that you know of. I mean, I'm a lifelong learner. That's why I'm finishing my doctorate right now. So <laughs> it's like, you know, um, we really, really, um, and, and in that gatekeeping, I mean, there have been others who have come from outside of the region. So that that's the other thing I learned growing up. Um, people would say, you're not a traditional Pittsburgher because no, because my dad believed in taking us across every river. So my um, understanding of neighborhood and boundaries is probably bigger than most. We went everywhere. Every Sunday we went on a trip. So I know that I can, there are, there's an outside um, vision or gaze um, that, that needs to be from those that are outside that we trust but we need to have, they need to be able to speak into our region. They're, they they give us um, sight beyond who we are and where we are. They extend our, 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 um, our vision and they also extend our reach. And so there are people from outside that are globally that speak in and um, give us advice and help. But it's, it's almost as if they look at us like a jewel and um, they don't want to destroy it. They don't want to to um, take advantage of the area, but they would really like to enhance it. So those people, when they show up, you, you, you know, we vet them. Cause like I said, Mon Valley people are tough, but once you pass the test, man, we will run with you. And I, I really, really appreciate that, that type of input. It's nice meeting you. Nice meeting you as well. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Thank you, PJ. And I think, um, so your response to that, Lisa, brought up another really great point in terms of um, boundaries and, and thinking globally. Um, but you also mentioned recognizing the assets that already existed within the Mon Valley. And so when you're talking about like that gatekeeping of um, like, you know, what has worked in other communities, different places that may look and sound similar, but like, in the context of what is going to work and needs to happen here. I see you like nodding vigorously. Like, yes, we've thought about this. Could you speak a little bit about um, how you balance like that new shiny, ooh, it's guaranteed to work in this place because it's similar versus really um, getting to like the, the culture look and feel of what it means to be successful in Mont Valley? So personally, I'm a process person and I like to do things in threes and then fives. So I believe if you can do three things really, really well and show um, the data and the and keep track of what you're doing and show the progression of three things and you add two more, then you can stand. And you can show people like with my hand, five things, I can do five things well. So we looked at our community and we say, okay, what are the needs? And you can ask folks from the Pittsburgh Foundation, folks from Hillman Foundation, when they came out to talk to me, I put them in my car. And the first place I take them is the Monongahela Cemetery. And I, we stand up at the top of the Monongahela Cemetery. And that's where the, the cemetery where my parents are actually buried. And you can see from that vantage point, you can see North Braddock, Braddock, Braddock Hills, and then you can see across the river and you can see as far as downtown Pittsburgh. And that's the process that I use in terms of how we approach things. What's immediate in our reach? Cause you have to be able to change that in several ways. You have to be able to, I mean, when I got on council, the first thing I had to do was I realized I had to change a culture, a mindset that takes a long time. And how you do that is like little trust, little things, showing them your process, being transparent, and, and then introducing small things over time. So we had to change culture immediate, right, in our immediate atmosphere. Then what's next to us? Next to us is Braddock, Rankin, um, East Pittsburgh, across the way. So bring, building connectors. So building relationships to sustain while we're doing that little cultural change, changing identity piece in our region, and then bringing outside beams and, and then looking across the river. Because if the people across the river are sustained and fortified, if there are things that we can join and lock arms with them, then we're stronger. 
and then downtown, right? Um, the one thing about our region is, especially North Braddock is, we always say we're close to everywhere. You can get to just about anywhere from there within a short period of time. So to, to be able to look at the things, at the immediate needs in the neighborhood, what is going to change the culture? Well, one of the first things in my neighborhood, in our area, is it looks terrible. It's depressing. There's mental health issues that even go with that. There's health. We have lead in the soil. So there's that that need to be changed. That there's air, you know, the US steel plant is right there. There's air. So the things to sustain, here we go to your social determinants, right? Things that help people with their health. Like working in businesses don't matter if you're if you're not well if you're not whole, if you're not healthy, and if you don't have a good healthy project. So attacking or those needs immediately. Um, there are some very basic things that really need propped up in our area. And so those are the first things that we're going after. Like I said, the three, the first most foundational pieces in the area, the first thing. So there is a lot of shiny stuff that comes, right? We We do have to use understand the use of AI in our work. We do have to understand the technological advances that are needed, but we have to be able to introduce them to our region at a, at a certain level. And then, like I said, what's immediate, what's next, and then what's across the way. And it, it, it's this, that's my approach pretty much with everything. And those things happen simultaneously because you can't wait till you get the immediate needs met before you go into the next. You have to just get a good handle of those things and then find processes, create lexicons and, and language that helps to, to introduce the next thing. But it's very um, intentional as well as, so everything doesn't work right now, but and there were some things that we tried to introduce too quickly um, that didn't work. So we have to figure out the process that, you know, because the the world is changing around us very quickly. Um, the the things that are coming from the government, like with Justice 40 and the the, the needs and uh, the meeting the underserved. And it's almost like a fire hose of resources. We do have to get our act together pretty quickly to be able to synthesize that stuff and get that money to the people who can who actually need it because we are the folks that need it but how we do that is very strategic we're very pensive and um you just have to build that that process like almost that factory floor that's really solid um to synthesize that stuff while you're bringing new things so yes there everything doesn't work but we but like air water <laughs> you know like we are basically like food air water i mean really north braddock braddock all of these regions we need the basic stuff to really jobs housing like a house that's not falling apart um uh, roads that are good places and ways to get to transportation i mean the basic stuff um we really need we we're not like mount lebanon where we can kind of we're already there and we can go to the next thing but we're finding ways of being able to bring in the basics, but also keep us up to date on the things that the innovative stuff. It's, it's not. It's, it's a lot to balance. Um, and just kind of adding in that other layer that you spoke to early on. This is my last question, I promise. Um, oh, you're fine. But what are what is the alignment of some of the advocacy pieces with that? Um, so as you know, as issues are coming up um, that are very near and dear to folks. Um, you mentioned housing, education, kind of th those basic needs pieces. How does the um, Chamber of Commerce advocate um, for individuals that it connects with? The individuals, a lot of that has to do with getting information to people. And we're working on right now a communication process that we find to be really important um, that, and we're developing that with Main Street, um, a, a communication process that gets information to people in the way that they can digest it, but it also, in a way that it also educates them. So that's, that's one thing. Um, another way, so there are a few projects, like I said, the Braddock Loss Project is a big deal. 
the eco the workforce development ecosystem that we're developing is a huge deal but also so when when the listening sessions happened right now that information is still being synthesized there's about four or five major areas that the people have said that they need uh, addressed immediately so the chamber will create events around those things to keep the people informed and to keep their voice and to keep their hands in it until we create those projects or bring the things that they want to fruition. So it's an ongoing back and forth, but a lot of it has to do with a developing a communication system that I can't say too, too much about, but, um, we find it to be um, key. Thank you. And um, I, I lied. This is actually the last question. Um, okay. So Mary Kate jumped in and she said, um, what plans, funding, or projects are you most hopeful about? I really love that as like a final thought for the discussion. So um, there is a, well, some of it I can't really say because <laughs> There's one that's really, really, really near and dear to my heart that's a game changer. And the only thing I can say about it, um, and this is sad because, you know, the the broader funding community, we're, we're really trying to join forces, um, nonprofits together. So there's not this sort of crabs in the barrel kind of um, fight. Like, I can't say anything because I, you'll get funded and I won't and things like that. So we're working with other nonprofits to, to present ourselves as a collaborative. But there's, there's one project that's, it comes from a very special place. Um, my mother was a job developer in Braddock for almost 50 years. She worked until she was 86 she wore three and a half inch heels and she beat career links numbers in employing people hands down by herself. And she had a, a way that she engaged the community that she taught me. Um, and so I learned those things probably, you think by osmosis, but you know how the kid who grows up in the home with the family who knows how to make shoes, the kid automatically knows how to make shoes. Now, whether they want to become a shoemaker or not, down the road is one thing, but they know how to do the thing. I I knew, uh, I understood uh, job creation and workforce development since probably around the age of eight or nine, um, because I would go to work with mom and she would, she actually would actually have me passing out tests or talking to people or interviewing. So there is a space that we are developing that deals with um, occupational identity. Um, I'm an identity person. I'm writing my dissertation on things that have to do with transformational work. That's why when Fred, Fred was using all the words today, I, like I said, it choked me up so bad. I almost couldn't do this interview. But um, there's a level of, of transformation um, that comes from identity and action and understanding how those two fit and how one comes from the other when you strengthen the identity of your organization, of your people, of yourself, then your action in the earth becomes sustained, um, more powerful, um, and, and actually, um, it, it's probably the reason why you're here, right? It's probably the thing you're supposed to be doing. So we are um, rolling out um, a space that will help people and organizations to be able to, to understand that that relationship. I can't say too much more about it, um, but it's, it's, it's a game changer, not just in our region, but it, it will change the game in terms of how things are done, um, probably moving forward, really in Southwestern Pennsylvania. Um, that's, how, that's how strongly we feel about, that's, the, that's one of the most, uh, the projects that we're the most passionate about. And it connects to this, I saw in the chat where someone talked about the workforce ecosystem. So we have uh, partnered with the two COGS, um, the TRICOG, um, Turtle Creek Valley COG, the Steel uh, Rivers COG, 
and um, Mon Valley Initiative, the Heritage, um, Main Street, and there are probably like two or three other partners in this group where we've created a workforce development ecosystem that addresses work at several levels in several regions in the Mon Valley. I mean, it actually goes, it's probably hits about 12 neighborhoods um, across the river as well, Homestead, McKeesport, um, and then further out like Pitcairn and Wall. And so um, that was our reimagining uh, workforce. We're still working on that. And um, it's, it's if it if that hits, which we believe that it will, um, it will also change the way in which things are done in our area. And and we need it. We really need these things. And so when Fred talked about, you know, being a somewhat combative or disruptive, and that's only the way people look at you when you say the things that they don't really want you to say when you say them, but they need to be said. Um, you know, this this is what's come up from the folks who said this is what we need. They, they don't just need funds. They need handheld to know how they can access more funding. They don't just need uh, to know, um, okay, so I have a restaurant. They need to know how to fill the forms out, how to, how, what taxes to file. Um, what does my year look like in terms of funding, um, bank account? Uh, how do I keep inventory? I mean, people just don't want you to just throw things at them and say, okay, cattle call, stand in a line, go sit down, figure out what you want to do and do it. They really want to be shaped and they want to be in relationship as they're learning about themselves, what they put their hands to and how they create freedom and flourishing in the region. And that's transformational work. So that's what we try to do. That's the level of attention we give to people. That's the level of attention we give to our region. That's how we handle our neighborhoods uh, and the folks in them. And that's how we deal with each other. So, Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, and Bree, thank you for launching the poll so folks can give us their feedback. Um, Lisa, I, I think you spoke so beautifully, and I'm so glad that this is recorded in the last couple of minutes about how all of this fits together. Um, so thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you for the work that you're doing. And um, I'm looking forward to see you again on Friday for our faith-based yeah. leadership discussion. Um, I'm going to jump right into our updates for today from the Forbes Funds and GPNP as folks are filling out their polls. Uh, let me share my screen real quick. All right. Let's see. So um, on the AI and data sovereignty topic, we have three cohorts we're going to be launching in the next um, couple of weeks here in partnership with Mad Labs. Um, some of the data sovereignty work that PJ spoke about um, is going to be a little bit later in the year. And the, the difference between AI and data sovereignty, this is where those cohorts are going to dig into um, each of those topics specifically. So the first cohort of the AI cohort is the strategic design in a box. So um, thinking critically through issues, having a um, kind of a simple business mindset and saying, okay, I'm doing a strategic plan with my organization. What are some of the things that I need to knock out in that process? And then how can I start thinking about technology leveraging um, to really maximize the impact of that work? Cohort two is the brick business mindset to help upskill and reskill development leaders to become even more effective. Um, and this is actually implementing an internal AI assistant to facilitate faster grant making, decision making, partnership discussions, um, and activating funders and question lists um, to really speak to what your organization is doing consistently internally and across partnerships. The third cohort is externally facing AI, um, and it's a development assistant or digital employee that organizations would bring on and train that would have the tone, voice, um, language, not literally, like it's not going to be a recorded voice of Fred speaking for the Forbes funds, but more so how he answers questions. Um, and so learning about, you know, how that voice can be applied to different questions that come in um, and taking that piece of the work away from human employees so that the human employees can focus more on the trust and relationship building. So all three of those cohorts um, 
uh, more information available soon. I'll be sending out some reminders this week. Um, this Friday, February 9th, 930 to 11 is our second faith-based nonprofit affinity group meeting. It's the Hebron Community Center. Jennifer Balkley um, kindly agreed to host the next discussion um, and Penn Hills. If you would like to be part of this, please RSVP to me, Emily at ForbesFunds.org. Um, and we'll be convening these groups every two weeks. Reverend Rebecca Gilmer help us, helped us kick off the first discussion following the summit presentation that she hosted um, with 10 faith-based leaders from throughout Southwest PA. It was a wonderful discussion. And this group, we're going to be setting our purpose and intention, um, but also our process for operating and how that's going to fit within the faith-based community, how GPNP and the Forbes Funds can support, and then some other immediate goals um, to Lisa's point. What are the three things that we could do effectively right now together? Um, and then how can we kind of own different pieces of that moving forward? Um, so thank you so much. I'm going to skip over this one. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We will not have a call for community solutions next week um, as we have a meeting during this, um, this community solutions time. And then the following week is a holiday weekend. So I will see you three weeks from now um, for our next call for community solutions. But thank you so much for joining us on these Monday mornings. I hope they fuel you for the day and for the week. And I look forward to seeing you all in the very near future. Have a great week.